This week, I give you your next car, your next backpack, and your next pair of shoes. Welcome to one of the biggest air shows on the planet. This is the Farnborough International Air Show. A chance to see the newest aircraft up close and witness them being put through their paces. I mean, really, something that big should not be doing that. <laughs> Alongside the air displays, this is where the aviation industry does its business. And on the first of seven show days, orders were made for more than 300 aircraft and deals of almost $50 billion were struck. Oh my goodness. I mean, it's just so incredible to see what these enormous flying bits of metal can do. But interestingly, the next big thing in aviation could be quite small and very personal. This is the Black Fly, a new type of single passenger craft. Now, you may have never heard of Opener, the company that made it, and that's because it's been operating in secret for the past nine years. The eight rotors are powered by the onboard battery, offering travel distances of about 25 miles. In the US, speeds would be restricted to 62 miles per hour. You don't need a runway because this PAV, or personal aerial vehicle, can take off and land vertically. In fact, it doesn't even have wheels. And that's partly due to its amphibious ambitions. It can land on water if necessary. Now, after you've towed it to your takeoff spot, it's time to quickly assemble the craft. Opener is targeting enthusiasts who have open stretches of uninhabited grassland that they need to get between. Well, who doesn't? America's FAA has approved the design, which has an autopilot function. In fact, it's even said that riders won't need to hold a pilot's license. It's one of several companies hoping to change how our skies look. Earlier this year, we reported on Uber's plans for sky taxis. With the help of Bell, Volocopter also sees autopilot taxis as the way forward, while Chinese firm Ehang is perfecting its own small drone-like craft to be either piloted by enthusiasts or self-flying taxis. This week, Aston Martin joined the growing list of companies with personal aviation in its sights when it showed off its concept design, and Rolls-Royce pitched in with its own helicopter-like four-seater. So, personal aviation is fast becoming a thing. Opener says it hopes to begin selling the Blackfly from next year at the cost of an SUV. And while that's not an exact figure, it seems that it would be within the price range of quite a few people in the US and elsewhere. Now, just after the Black Flight was announced, it was revealed that the man funding it all is Google co-founder Larry Page. And this is a guy who seems to collect flying cars like they were Cadillacs. Because this week, there was another big announcement from his fleet, this time in Las Vegas. And Dave oh, Lee yes, travelled there in a boring old normal plane to check out Jane, the Kitty Hawk. This used to be a top secret project but not anymore. You're seeing the Kitty Hawk Flyer in all its glory. So many people think this thing is the first step in a dream that we as humans have had for a long time, the dream of flying around in a flying car. This test flight flown by Brittany lasted around nine minutes. Right now, battery capacity allows for around 20 minutes, but the speed is limited to six miles per hour. Not exactly fast travel, but you can cut them some slack. 
This is a flying car after all. I really don't have to think about a lot other than letting the aircraft do its thing and then putting it where I want to go. It's like that simple. It's, that's the beauty of it because you're out there, you're flying, beautiful scenery, and I just tell it where I want to go and I don't have to overthink anything, overthink the controls. Um, so it's like all you get to think about is how awesome it is to fly. <laughs> Kitty Hawk has created this small hangar at the edge of a lake near Las Vegas. The location is important, it rarely rains, but it does get incredibly hot and sometimes too windy to fly. The vehicle itself weighs less than 254 pounds, which is important because it means the US Aviation Authority does not require a rider to have a pilot's license. Instead, Kitty Hawk puts them through a training regime that lasts just 90 minutes. First a simulator, then a real machine strapped to the ground, and then this fun ball pool with a serious purpose. This is where you practice getting out if the flyer was to crash into the water. And here we go. Oh. Oh. Okay. There's not much of an interior yet, but I imagine they'll be working on that. And here's the seatbelt. Sadly, they wouldn't let me fly it myself, but I did at least have a chance to try it out for size. So I'm in, and then I have the controls here. One of them does altitude. The other one is the direction of where I'm traveling. These things, they're gonna crash one day, right? Have you had any issues? Has one falling out of the sky yet? We, uh, we, we have not had a single, uh, uh, flying, flying people here at least like places, we, we have not had a single person go in the water. Um, we do a ton of flight testing on this. Um, and, uh, and as we're always developing new things, like we find, we, we find bugs and we fix bugs. That's like a huge core part of what we do. As is often the case with new exciting technology like this, it's not the question of whether they can do it, but whether we're gonna be allowed to. In order for this flyer to be a reality in our daily commute, a lot of laws need to change to make it possible. But it's not the only way humans can get into the sky. Dan Simmons has been looking at another idea. So the jetpack does 250 miles an hour, it'll go up to 5,000 metres, which is like 15,000 feet, it can fly for about 10 to 15 minutes, and it only weighs about 65 kilos. Goodwood's main straight is more familiar with fast cars than jetpacks screaming past the stands. But as part of the Future Lab exhibition here, this man dreams of us all taking to the skies. This jetpack, as soon as the whole thing's off, you do want to clear all that fuel and all that baggage. It might be the JB11, it might be new, it might be extra special in the amount of power and the amount of agility that it offers David as he goes flying around this circuit. But once he's done with it, just get the thing off. Great landing, Thank like you. it. Tell me a little bit about this. So JB11, uh, six engines. This is our latest version. So JB11, so this is the 11th iteration? This is the 11th version. So there'd been 10 before this. Flew around Statue of Liberty in JB9. That's, God, it's two years ago now. But that only had two engines. So you've got a bit of redundancy. You can lose one of these thrusters yeah. and you'll still stay up. Yeah, exactly. And the computers, they've got to be pretty robust. Where, where are they on here? So the computers, there's one computer in here. That one's the starting one that's on the throttle. And then there is a computer system in here. That's our main computer in this distribution system. And then each of the engines have their own, has their own computer. So there's six computers, uh, then master computer and then throttle computer. So a lot of computers. How long has it taken to get to this stage with a jetpack? Over 12 years. Yeah, I started on it 12 years ago and it's, it's gone quickly, but it's been uh, a hell of a process. And now you've got this, this is supposed to be in the sweet spot, isn't it? I'm just going to just dive in here. I don't know whether, is this okay if I just sort of yeah, yeah. sit here? I'm not going to take yeah. her up for a spin. No. But from this position, yeah. what am I looking at here? So on the, on the pilot side, yeah. you're looking at uh, on the left engine and the right engine. So you're looking at all the engine information on okay. this side. Yeah. So how hot they are, how fast they're spinning, what's the battery voltage, how much fuel are you using? 
uh, etc. That's that's this side. And when the battery's turned on, you'll see all of that information come up there. Okay? Right. Okay. And those LEDs are basically, if it's green, everything's good, fly. <laughs> if it's orange, probably you want to start thinking about it. If it's red, definitely land. Jetpack Aviation says the JB-11 would sell for north of $300,000 if the public could be trusted to be let loose with one, which is why it's not for sale. Although the US military is looking into its use, as they have been with jetpacks for the last 50 years. The new design will wow crowds around the world, but it could also offer us the chance to have taster flight sessions in the near future. You know, my idea is that Young kids or 14 year old kids, you know, my daughter included, should be able to fly one of these like on a tether system in complete safety and get a feel for the future of aviation because, you know, it's not big aeroplanes anymore. It's about the capacity for indi individuals to move around their environment, you know, to go from their house to the shops or to their house, you know, to be able to take a, an autonomous flying vehicle from one place to another. It will happen. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but it'll happen. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that Google was fined a record 3.9 billion pounds for illegally cementing its dominant position in search. Amazon's Jeff Bezos was announced to be the richest man in the world worth a whopping 113 billion pounds. And Netflix saw its shares drop by over 14% after reporting disappointing subscriber growth. It was also the week that shares at Tesla plummeted after Elon Musk insulted one of the British rescuers of 12 Thai footballers and their coach from a cave. The billionaire was angry after Fern Unsworth called Musk's mini submarine designed but not used for the rescue a PR stunt. Musk later apologized for calling Unsworth a pedophile on Twitter. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg controversially defended the rights of its users, including Holocaust deniers, to free speech on the social network. Zuckerberg said while he finds Holocaust denial deeply offensive, he doesn't think Facebook should take down content just because people may be getting information wrong. The remote north coast of Scotland will be the first place in the UK to get a spaceport, which could be ready to start small rocket launches within four years. And finally, do you talk to your plants? Would you like to take them for a walk but don't have time? Now you can employ this adaptable hexa robot. It's been demonstrating ways to look after your plants, taking them for a walk, letting you know when they need water, and even dancing when the plant is happy. The company hopes that one day these little bots would be looking after creatures on Mars. Away from the amazing aerobatics of the Farnborough Air Show, the aviation industry is doing big business here and showcasing its newest innovations. One of the mid-term goals of the field is to make electric and then possibly solar-powered planes. Well, these are the first pictures of the latest Airbus Zephyr plane, an unmanned solar aircraft which is currently circling above Arizona, where it's hoped it can stay up continuously for 30 days at altitudes of 70,000 feet in the stratosphere. And today, at Farnborough, Airbus has given us an exclusive look at the new Zephyr S. And this is the UK production facility for the Zephyr S. And there it is, 25 metres long, just those two little propellers. But the most amazing thing, I think, is how much it weighs. 75 kilograms, which is about the same as me. High above commercial aircraft and bad weather, there are two suggested uses for this so-called high-altitude pseudo-satellite. Remote surveillance or as a communication platform in remote parts of the world. So this is reaching out to those 4 billion people in the world today that have no link to the internet and this is a game changer what the Zephyr can bring into play here. So the problem with the satellite, it's great for persistency, but what happens when you want to change a payload? You're not bringing a satellite down and say, let's quickly change the payload. And this is where the beauty of the Zephyr comes in. That's the flexibility. That means we can bring the bird down, we can put a new payload on and we can send it back up again. And this means we can take the big leaps in technology that are coming. We can take advantage of that and just put it onto Zephyr and send it back up again. 
However, the main challenge for these types of planes is keeping them aloft at night. Without the sun to power them, they need to rely on rechargeable batteries to keep the propellers turning. The key is to allow the plane to gradually lose height in the dark, but make sure it's still above 50,000 feet by the time the sun rises again. This height is called your dawn altitude. We've just got the news that's come in from the team that we've set a new dawn altitude record of 59,000 feet, which is outstanding and uh, really going beyond uh, the expectations that we even had. Such are the harsh conditions and constant recharging cycle in the stratosphere. The Zephyr will need to come down every three months to have its batteries replaced. And on top of all this, Airbus is also collaborating with Facebook, who recently ditched its own solar plane project, Aquila. We've been talking about the so-called wonder material that is graphene for a while now. This one layer thick carbon was the world's first 2D material, a million times thinner than a human hair and stronger than steel. Oh, and it's flexible, super light, conductive, has thermal properties, the list goes on. So whilst it may be commonly used in smartphones, for example, why is it not, well, everywhere? Well, the trouble is there's no set standard for measuring graphene, which means manufacturers who could be incentivised to use it don't really know what they're working with. But that could be about to change. A launch today at UK Parliament aims to standardise what constitutes graphene. And it has come some way since we first talked about it on the programme a few years back. In fact, I've even been testing some graphene trainers. They feel pretty normal to run in, but the benefits are really meant to be felt further down the line. It's their durability and flexibility, particularly over tougher terrain, that is where they're claimed to come into their own. But the potential uses of the material are vast and varied, keeping researchers back at the lab pretty busy. Well, here at the National Physical Laboratory, pretty impressive, isn't it? Not only are they testing the latest ways that graphene could be used, but also they have this chemical mapping system, which is just one part of the equipment to actually test the graphene content in any item. Is it not just as simple as working out what percentage of graphene an item would need to be to qualify as graphene? So yeah, the first issue is understand uh, the measurement of that material itself to say, well, is there graphene in there? Is there a few layer graphene? Is there graphite? Again, when you're getting the black powder, there could be anything in there. So that is the first issue of having measurement procedures that everyone can follow. You need to understand, well, is the graphene actually dispersed in this composite? Because if it isn't, it's going to be a big clump in one part. It's going to actually make the composite worse. Well, I've actually got my hands on a whole vial of graphene here. And for something with such qualities, isn't this rather a lot? What could you do with it? Yeah, so these are graphene flakes in a, in a powder, so sort of thing you would imagine adding into a composite. So if you think of something like making uh, lighter weight planes uh, for fuel uh, savings, this is the sort of material that you'd need to put into the composites already used in planes today. OK, and for our batteries, our devices, are these the sort of flakes that would be used within that? Yeah, again, for yeah, energy storage batteries or for even things such as making an ink and making uh, printed flexible electronics as well. Back at Farnborough, I've come to see the latest research by Rolls-Royce into keeping our current crop of jet engines safe and well-maintained. Sometimes a bit of debris can get sucked into an engine and it can hit one of the blades and damage it. It might bend it out of shape ever so slightly and that's really dangerous because as this engine spins millions of times, the blade could end up cracking. Now what you usually do is send someone out to where the engine is to ever so slightly shave away the damage. They remove the part of the blade that is bent. Well, this is a prototype bore blending robot which you can attach to the outside of the engine and then a teleoperator can remote control this part of it and they could be anywhere in the world. What they do is they lower this tube into the engine. There's a camera and a scanner in there to assess the damage. And once they find the damage, they use this tiny little dental drill here to remotely shave away the damage. Bob's your uncle. And one day, engine damage could be assessed by this little fella. 
and its friends wiggling into the crevices of the machinery. If me or you went and inspected a combustion chamber, it'd take us hours, just because we've got to get inside with a flexible bed, of, basically a bit of spaghetti, and look around and map everything that's in there, all those features. But with these, we could send in maybe five or ten. They could all go to different parts of it and transmit the images back. And we've got a very quick map of the inspected area. So the whole point is trying to make things efficient, get the plane back out flying. A group of people we're working on at the moment are doing some pretty exciting stuff where we're walking around upside down on bits of engines. So it's, although it looks like science fiction, there are areas where we're building the, the key kind of building blocks to make it work. They walk upside down in engines? Yes, we have to make them walk upside down because we want to inspect all of the, the surface area. And so how do you achieve that? Are they magnetic? So I can't disclose too many details about that. That's a, oh, that's that's a publication. That's your secret source. That's a publication that's in review just now. And this is just the prototype. The real robot will be half this size. Now, from robots that can repair damage to robots intent on destruction. Let's head to China for something completely different. Shenzhen Bay Sports Centre. Home to the region's biggest sporting events with room for 20,000 spectators. And every summer, this place hosts one event with a difference. Welcome to DJI RoboMasters. A big, loud robo shootout. In each round, two teams remote control their robot tanks around a complex battlefield. The aim, to take out the opponent's base robot while defending your own. And before the 2018 RoboMaster event this weekend, I joined one of the teams for a little battle practice. Ni hao. Hello. I'm Spencer. Let's do this. Let's do this. So talking team tactics is going to be difficult on account of the Chinese English thing. Go. This competition is all about attracting and inspiring engineering students who get to massively redesign and modify the starter kits, which contain four ground robots and a drone. Now, these already come with lasers for aiming. They fire balls at the opposing team's pressure sensors and they have wacky wheels. This is huge fun. The whole thing feels like a really realistic video game. Come on! What started as a competition for local universities has now become a mega event, attracting talent from all over the world. Students work for months honing their designs. Turning these beasts into ultimate fighting machines is no easy task. To prepare students with this kind of system thinking, we need to give them a, a project where they can, we can integrate the different areas, let them learn how to coordinate as a team that they have uh, idea conflicts and they are collaborating with each other. And that's what we did actually in company. For a drone, we have algorithms, we have uh, electrical circuits, we have mechanical design. And a drone is similar to a ground robot. So it's a very good way for them to train. Each bot is transmitting back a live point of view image. Any delay in transmission and you're toast. Oh, am I dead? That was, but I was the longest lasting of the three of us. We will hope that a robotics competition like this in the future can become a popular sport where people don't admire those athletes, but they admire engineers. Brilliant, and that's it from my A350 and my attack helicopter for this week. Hope you've enjoyed what you've seen. Don't forget there are loads of extra photos up on Twitter at BBC Click, and we also live on Facebook too. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>